Hello everybody and welcome to the comprehensive guide to Weaver for Aghanim's Labyrinth. This guide is intended for the December 2021 version, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if the concepts behind it remain valid for many versions to come. The Deforo channel will be uploading a ton of content ranging from gaming to music to art and business and beyond, so if any of that is of interest to you then hit the subscribe button below to stay up to date. Now with the introductions out of the way, let's get on to strategy. In an effort to keep this guide as organized as possible, I have broken it down into 9 different parts. Each of these parts should be bookmarked either on the video itself or in the comments below, so feel free to skip ahead to whichever section you may need. The first part is why choose Weaver. What makes Weaver special? What makes Weaver stand out amongst all of the other hero choices? And to this I have three responses. The first two responses are not unique to Weaver, but the third one absolutely is. And the third response is the reason I cite Weaver as being the best possible pick for this mode. The first reason is Weaver is highly elusive. Whether it's Shikuchi or his ult time lapse or Swarm itself, Weaver is able to get into and out of situations safely and with ease. The second reason to pick Weaver is his extremely high damage potential. Just take a look at some of these scorecards I've had from previous wins in Apex and GM. With this build, it is entirely possible to consistently hit over a million damage on wins and more often than not, you will have the highest damage output on your team. The third final and best reason to pick Weaver is his Swarm ability. Swarm acts as both your shield and your sword. Much like Undying's Tombstone, most enemy units will attack your Swarm before they attack you or your teammates. And in some instances, you can even use Shikuchi to control who the enemy unit will attack you are Swarm. If you want the enemy unit to attack you, then simply walk up close to them and let them follow you while you run around and kite them. If you want the enemy unit to attack Swarm, simply use Shikuchi to get away real quick, and then the enemy unit should start attacking Swarm instead of you. That right there, Weaver's ability to bend aggro to his will, is what makes him the most capable pick for this mode. No other hero is able to replicate this. It is truly unique to Weaver. Which brings us to part 2, Ability Overview. Weaver's four abilities are as follows. The Swarm, Shikuchi, Geminate Attack, and Time Lapse. Despite the function of these abilities remaining static between normal gameplay and labyrinth gameplay, the application of these abilities varies drastically. The first thing we will discuss is ability order, and it is pretty straightforward. Your first ability depends entirely upon which legendary shards you get first. In the event that you get Bug Boom first, you would want to skill the Swarm. In the event that you get anything other than Bug Boom first, you will want to skill Shikuchi. Your second ability should depend on your first ability. If you pick the Swarm first, you should get Shikuchi second. If you pick Shikuchi first, you should get the Swarm second. Beyond this, you should prioritize skilling the Swarm and then Shikuchi. Leave Geminate attack until the end as you won't be doing much right clicking. You should also level up your ult anytime it becomes available. For your special abilities, you should get the plus 50 Shikuchi damage, the plus 2 attacks to destroy, plus 0.5 swarm armor reduction, and plus 475 health. In regard to the application of these skills, which will be discussed in much greater detail in the playstyle section, you basically want to play around swarm. The idea is to apply Swarm to as many units as possible, and then to use Shikuchi to either kite or to apply Swarm to other units in the event that you have Shikuchi Swarm. In Act 1, you should definitely right-click to help your team clear mobs, but beyond that you should keep right-clicking to a minimum. 
you want to fight almost exclusively with Swarm, either through applying it through your Swarm skill directly or through Shikuchi with Shikuchi Swarm. The reason why you want to keep right clicking to a minimum is because you don't need to right click. You have Swarm to put down physical damage for you and it does it to a dozen targets at once. There is simply no need for you to put yourself in danger like that. There are a few exceptions to this such as the Ursa stage, where tanking for your team is definitely beneficial. If you do end up in a position where you are tanking for your team, obviously keep an eye on the damage that you take, but also be mindful that your ultimate ability will allow you to reverse a lot of that damage if it happened quickly. If you happen to be tanking the Ursa stage specifically where your ult is not available to you, I wouldn't go any lower than a third health. Once you get to a third health, do normal range DPS things. Just apply your swarm and right click until Ursa starts chasing you, then run away. And as a side note, in regard to stages like Ursa and Mars, if a teammate is tanking, you better be putting down damage. Part 3 is the Legendary Shard Overview. Again, this is pretty straightforward. I'm not even going to talk about all of the shards. We're just going to talk about the ideal 3 plus maybe a 4th. The Legendary Shards you want to look out for are, in proper order, Bug Bug Boom, Shikuchi Swarm, and Bug Your Friends. So I'll break down what each of these top three shards do. Bug Bug Boom detonates your beetles at the end of their duration or whenever they get destroyed. Whenever the beetles detonate, they detonate for 150% of the damage they did to that target. And the detonation does AOE damage. The awesome thing about Bug Bug Boom is that when you cast Swarm, you launch a dozen plus Swarm Beetles at a single time, and often at a cluster of enemies. And whenever each of the Beetles that is attached to each of those enemies explodes, it damages every single enemy in the area. So basically, with Bug Bug Boom, anytime you hit Q. Everything in front of you just disappears, and it is a truly beautiful sight to behold. Next up is Shikuchi Swarm. And a note about the ordering of these first two, if you roll both Bug Bug Boom and Shikuchi Swarm together, get Bug Bug Boom. But if you don't see Bug Bug Boom and only Shikuchi Swarm shows up, still be very happy because Shikuchi Swarm is probably the best starting skill. The reason why I say that is because it effectively eliminates the 30 second cooldown timer that the Swarm would normally have, and your cooldown timer is now based upon Shikuchi, which is a whole lot less. The third legendary shard is Bug Your Friends, which allows Swarm to heal any allies that it attaches to. And this works spectacularly well with Bug Bug Boom because the explosion also works on allies but it applies heal damage. And towards the end of the game you can basically full heal an ally off of Bug Bug Boom's explosion damage. One really neat side note about the combination of Bug Bug Boom and Bug Your Friends when you have an Undying on your team is that the Swarm will stick to and heal Undying Zombies. And whenever the Swarm detonates on top of these zombies, it damages any nearby enemies. Since Undying Zombies automatically follow enemies, you basically have yourself a cluster of heat-seeking missiles. And this is actually amazingly effective against single unit stages such as boss maps, where you can send a horde of zombies to do explosive damage around a boss when normally no such units would be present for your swarm to attach to. Two legendary shards that get honorary mentions are Hive Mind and All's Well that starts well. Hive Mind adds AoE damage to swarm ticks, so any enemy units standing within a certain range of an affected unit will start taking a third of swarm's damage. 
All's Well That Starts Well brings you to full health any time you cast your ultimate ability. Which sounds kind of mediocre, but it has paid off plenty of times, and it's usually one of my go-tos when a choice shard does not appear. Part 4 is the Minor Shard Overview. There are four shards that you are going to want to look out for. They are, in order, plus 12 damage, plus 2 seconds duration, plus 1 attacks to destroy, and minus 0.5 armor. I think the best way to describe how you should divvy out your selection of these shards is to set a bare minimum bar for each of them. So we will go about it that way. As far as damage, you are going to want Swarm to do somewhere around 100 per tick or higher. For duration, you're going to want Swarm to last somewhere around 10 seconds. For attacks to destroy, you are going to want somewhere around 6. And keep in mind that one of your special ability upgrades does give you plus 2 attacks to destroy. And for the armor reduction, honestly just grab it whenever nothing else is there. The higher the better. It's not something that I specifically aim for though. Part 5 is the items overview. For this build, there are four core items, and there's only four core items, so that way no matter what in Apex, you can finish this build. We'll start with the four items, and then I will go into the order in which I get them. The four items you are going to want are Guardian Greaves, Octarine Core, Eternal Shroud, and Windwalker. The order that I personally get these in is, from the boots at the start, I will get the spell Lifesteal Mask that builds into Eternal Shroud, but I'll just get the mask. Then I will build Arcane Boots. Then I will build Aether Lens, and that's all usually up by the first boss. From there I will finish Octarine Core. Then I will finish Eternal Shroud. Then I will get Yules. I'll finish Guardian Greaves, then I'll finish Windwalker. The purpose of most of these items is self-explanatory, but I feel like Eternal Shroud and Windwalker deserve a special mention. Spell Lifesteal does in fact work with Swarm, and it is a great way to keep yourself at full health almost all of the time due to the amount of damage that Swarm does. You're not healing off of one unit, you're healing off of every single unit that Swarm hits, and it sends a dozen plus beetles at a single time. Windwalker deserves a section of its own. It is the single most powerful item in this game mode, and I don't care what character you play, you should have it. Uh, you can hop walls with it to get away from very serious threats. You can use it to skip mechanics, such as the final boss mechanic, which is in a previous video that I had recorded. Uh, you can even do other shenanigans that I'm not so uh, keen on sharing because they will absolutely be abused in the wrong way. But you can do a lot with Yules, and if you play around with it enough, you'll start to figure it out. Part 6 is the playstyle overview. The playstyle for this Weaver build boils down to two core concepts. Playing around Swarm and kiting everything. We had mentioned playing around Swarm previously in the ability overview section, so I'll kind of take this opportunity to reiterate what we said there and expand on it a little bit. So previously we had called Swarm our sword and our shield, meaning that it could be used both offensively and defensively. To use Swarm offensively, it's pretty intuitive. You just press Q and point in a direction and click and things just happen, but to use it defensively is a bit trickier. Most units in this mode will naturally aggro to swarm instead of you unless you do something out of the ordinary to get them to attack you instead. And being able to identify which units don't obey that is very helpful. Um, bosses tend to not obey that. Timbersaw will attack swarm first, so Timbersaw is an exception to bosses. 
Um, there's a few. There's a few that if they, if there's a player nearby, they'll go for the player instead. But you're Weaver, and you have an invisible skill. So in your particular case, you can break aggro where others can't, and you can get the enemy to attack Swarm instead of your team. In learning how and when and where to invoke that is in your best interest. And unfortunately, that's one of those develop learned skills and I can't really sit here and give you every single example where that can be used. I mean, but honestly, we're all Dota players and we we kind of know when and where and why and you know, you might want aggro and why you might not want aggro at certain times. So just use your basic Dota knowledge to kind of discern that. Or, or you could reference some of my previous replays. I post my perfect clears in Apex for that reason, so people could see where and when to do things. So uh, through, through various outside resources, apart from this this specific guide, you, you could find several examples of, of how and when to use Weaver's Swarm to take aggro off of your team. And, and it's really hard to stress enough just how central to Weaver being able to do this is. This is his entire shtick. This is what he does. This is why you pick him. So some tips as far as uh, using Swarm, which is your main skill set. Suppose we're just talking about the Q. If you have Shikuchi Swarm, obviously just run through everything and have fun. But if we're only using Q... It's, it's often better to wait to use it until you know that groups are going to line up, or like if you have a heal with it, to wait until a, a teammate is going to line up with a group so that way you could cast it once and just hit everything. Um, so one big piece of advice is to wait on the use. If, if waiting a couple seconds will put you in a better position to you know put down more damage and heals using Swarm, then by all means wait. You, you don't have to every 30 seconds type of thing, so... Make sure that the casts count, because the timer is pretty long. And lines are everything with Swarm Cast. It's a lot like TA, how she positions herself to hit as many creeps as possible with her extra damage. Think of Swarm in that exact same way. Keep yourself positioned to where anytime you cast Swarm, you're hitting as many things as possible. And the range on Swarm is ridiculous, so you could consider things across the map. And speaking of things across the map, whenever you cast Swarm, be mindful of that. Be mindful of how far Swarm is going to travel. You do not accidentally want to hit something across the map and then aggro everything to you. So whenever you're casting on something close by, like say at the beginning of a level when you don't want to venture out and the level's full of baddies, walk behind them and like cast out the door towards your team. Swarm is also a spectacular tool for gaining aggro. I'm going to use the Life Stealer stage as an example here because I know for sure that it works and I use it there all the time. But suppose you were to cast Swarm on a group of Life Stealers and Grimstrokes. Only the last unit to attack the last Swarm will aggro. So you can pull one unit from out of that entire clump, and specifically on the life stealer stage, that matters. You do not want to bring both of them together, otherwise you get stunned and killed. So uh, knowing how to aggro with swarm is not really a how. Knowing that you can aggro with swarm will go a long way. And kiting everything kind of ties directly into this. You do not want to be the guy sitting there right-clicking and tanking damage that is absolutely not you. You use Swarm to tank damage for you, and then you get somewhere safe, and then keep reapplying Swarm until that creature goes down. And that's basically what you do, which is kiting. Part 7 is saving the game. Weaver is spectacularly good at staying alive and you can use that to your team's advantage. You can very frequently ensure that a stage gets passed just by using the playstyle mentioned above. But supposing that everything does go wrong, here's a few tips to get you through that situation. So here's the scenario. You just died. It's your last life, so you're coming back to life, but the rest of your team is dead. And I'm going to start it from that point because it lets it leads into my first thing. So just go with it. 
So the first thing is to break aggro during your death timer and try and range cheese. If everything goes wrong, just try that. Your death timer is a unique moment. It allows you to get away without the enemy realizing where you are. And the enemy's gonna be at the last position you attacked from, so if you're able to get far enough away from that spot, some enemies can be cheesed at a distance and you might be able to pull that off since it's just you and you have a long range skill. If that doesn't work, you should use your own abilities to your advantage, such as the aforementioned swarm aggroing other units and Chikuchi giving you a massive speed burst. The combination of those two should allow you to kite just about anything. I've even kited Smashy and Bashy, and Bashy does not aggro to Swarm. He will hunt you down, and he had Surge. And with Weaver, I was able to outpace a Bashy with Surge. So if, I mean, if you could do that, you could basically outpace anybody. Just, yeah, rely on Weaver's skills. He is intrinsically elusive, and use that. It's, it's, it's what he's good at. So yeah, my follow-up tips for utilizing your death timer to break aggro would be to spam Shikuchi and Swarm to keep distance and to utilize Swarm aggro to your advantage. I cannot stress enough how important it is to kind of learn the mechanics behind that and it's just something you have to practice. It doesn't take too much practice, but it's still gotta be practiced. Just remember that Swarm is basically a tank for you. It's like a castable extra 12 characters that people have to go through before they get to you. And even if those people decide to not go through the 12 people and they just come straight for you, you're still doing a ton of damage to that group while they chase you and you're also probably faster than that group. So uh, you see what's gonna happen here. You just run around indefinitely while Swarm burns them down. Oh, and uh, let's not forget to mention that your ult is ridiculously broken. You can basically press R to undo any major mistake that you made. All right, so this is gonna be one of the longest sections just because I happen to have a lot of experience doing this with Weaver. Fighting the Primal Beast, part eight. So, oh god, I'm looking at the bullet points I have here. Alright, we're just gonna go down the list. Alright, so the first one, hang back and spam swarm. Which is true of every single situation, but really true here, because you don't need to be up close to that massive creature that can run you over. So just spam swarm and kinda hang out, hang back. Um, so during rocks, we'll kinda talk about the different phases here. During rocks, uh... There's, all right, so there's two ways to handle this, right? So if you happen to be able to get in close to the primal beast, get in close. I would say the ideal range is Juggernaut's base attack range or closer. If you get too close, it kind of skews the number of rocks that he throws. So like, don't be in the center of him, but like somewhere a little bit ahead of Juggernaut's base attack range. You will avoid all of the rocks. All of the rocks will go either like behind you or he'll just throw them out in left field because the AI is confused. I don't know what happens, but standing close to the primal beast is safe during rocks. If you happen to be in a place where you can't get close, what I usually do... So all right, here's the revelation that I had. One day I was fighting the primal beast and it dawned on me during this rock phase that this is just an AI that is trying to predict my movement. And I know that it's trying to predict my movement so I can make my movement really predictable and then just do something different. So basically what you wanna do here is walk in a straight line in any direction and the second you see him throw a rocket, you just turn around and you'll it'll miss you every single time. It's really simple as that. As soon as you see it from the perspective of this is an AI trying to predict my movement, you could just abuse it. So the, the rocks really are a non-issue. You should never be hit by a rock. The only time I ever get hit by a rock is whenever I don't stand close enough to the primal beast and like it'll just kind of nick my back leg. But that, that's about it. And yeah, rocks should, should never be an issue for anyone. It's not, not a weaver specific thing. Rocks should never be an issue. That's how you dodge them. Just walk in a straight line and then cut back or get in close. 
So the next bullet point also kind of ties into rocks. This is basically the only time where you're allowed to right click. Supposing you went with the option where you get in close to the primal beast. I, obviously you're not gonna stand there and just stare at him. So feel free to right click then, right? Then it's extra damage as dinky as it may be, it helps. And that's basically the only time that I would right click and feel good about it. Um, another opportunity is during his charge, if you're able to like duck to the side and kind of, but that that puts unnecessary risk. There's uh, your right click barely does anything to begin with. I, I wouldn't even call it worth it. So just during rocks, use that opportunity to right click, but aside from that, avoid it. You have a very special skill set as Weaver, especially when you're using Shikuchi Swarm and Bug Boom. You have the ability to instantaneously take down and or distract large groups of mobs in a way that absolutely no other hero can. So while your team is doing their thing fighting the primal beast and you're sitting there putting your swarm on the primal beast, keep an eye out for mobs. You are the person to clear them because you don't have to kind of... You, you can venture away from the primal beast to put down damage whereas your team doesn't really have that luxury. So while your team is doing the primal beast thing, go out and hunt down mobs. If you have Shikuchi Swarm, simply just Shikuchi through them and your job is done. If, if you got decent shards during the buildup, literally one Shikuchi through them should take out entire mobs, even, even if they're standing alone and they don't do the AoE damage. Swarm is powerful, and that's on Apex too. There's plenty of replays that I have where you see me running through a mob with Shikuchi and just don't even worry about it after that. Um, so that's your job, and that job is very important prior to the fractal. So like after he does the smashing on the ground, it usually creates a bunch of units, then the primal beast will jump to the center and then do the rawr smash and create the little uh, lightning fractals in the ground. Whenever he does that, there's usually a large mob that is going towards everybody who's trying to dodge the fractals. And you're really quick, and you're really good at eliminating mobs, and you have a long range skill. So you have maybe a 5 second window to kill every mob on the field, while the primal beast transitions from the circle smashing to the fractals. So that is your moment to shine, your team is counting on you right there, so make it a point to clear those mobs specifically during that phase. Alrighty, I'm gonna slip this one in here for the people who bothered to listen to this whole thing so far. During the earthquake stage, the stage where he smashes the ground and creates the large circles around him that everybody runs from, whenever he's chasing you, like he does a chase before that that leads up to it, it might not be chasing you, but that chase has a very specific time limit. Like the chase will always last that long. So get a feel for what that time is, and cast Yules a second before. If you do that, the beast will be completely unable to target you with his grab and smash, which means he's gonna go for one of your teammates instead, sparing you the damage, and since you're Weaver and you have a long range castable skill that can also heal people, zip to the outside of the earthquake after your Yules lands, and then cast your swarm in on the beast to heal whoever's being hit by him and to simultaneously hurt the beast. And supposing you got the ideal shards, whenever the beast releases your teammate, your te the bug boom will heal your teammate back to full health, period, while also giving them 100 heal per tick in the interim. My justification for casting a Yules at a time when I know it's going to directly harm a teammate is because I'm going to turn around and cast the dankest heal in this mode on you because of, you know, like it allowed me to get into a position to help. Yeah. So th there's that. And yeah, I feel I feel weird for mentioning that. Please don't please don't abuse that. But there's that. Aside from that cheeky and selfish Yules trick, uh, here's some other ways to avoid taking severe damage during Earthquake. Uh, I think by now everybody knows how Earthquake works. Red is about to explode, yellow is about to turn to red, and blank is blank. What I see a lot of people still slipping up on is say that you're standing on a red, and that red's gonna explode and you cannot escape it. Just stand there and take the damage. If you run off, 
it's gonna like I said, so what's gonna happen is it's gonna knock you up in the air briefly and hurt you a lot, and then you could carry on your ways. But if you're if you're running and get hit, it'll knock you up and say that you run into a yellow section. That yellow section's about to be red, and you just got knocked up and slowed, and that new red section's probably gonna pop you too. However, the section that you just left that already did damage to you turned into a clear spot on the ground, and you could have just stayed there and you would have been fine and only taken one instance of damage. Instead, you're scurrying around and taking like 10 and dying. So, one piece of advice that I would give to surviving earthquakes is if you do happen to be on a red ring that's going to explode, just stand there and take it because the ground will be clear right after. And it, it beats running off into a yellow that's going to bop you next. And yeah, so I'll, I'll add that to the pool of earthquake knowledge. Another cool little trick is to utilize Shikuchi's phase to your advantage. And... If you're able to get Shikuchi to the point where it's permanent, you basically have permanent phasing. And although I haven't really tried this too much, I do believe it's possible. Try and use Shikuchi during fractals to get underneath the primal beast. And then see if that works. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like some feedback on that. I'll probably try it myself. I happened to make this guide before I actually tested that. But I've noticed that towards the primal beasts, like tail region, I don't want to use like yeah, towards like the, the the tail side, the fractals don't exactly go there, so you could technically hide under his tail and be safe because you could phase. So I don't know, try that and get back to me. But utilizing Shikuchi's phasing is is another big tip, and you can use it in areas other than that, like also during Fractal. Say that you were not able to clear all of the mobs and some mobs are still chasing you while you're trying to dodge Fractals, just stand there and Shikuchi. Because if you Shikuchi, they're gonna get affected by the swarm. You phase through them, so like you don't have to run around them to dodge, or you could just run straight through them as if they weren't even there and just worry about your positioning while swarm does the tanking. And a final little tidbit of knowledge uh, during your primal beast fight is positioning during fractals which is hard to verbally describe but check out the clip that's going on in the background and that should do a decent job of explaining it part nine is putting it all together and this is the final section and it will take the form of a compilation of clips that i think demonstrate everything that we've talked about previously rather well but in Really cool, fun clip format with music in the background. With that said, I'm going to use the clip compilation as my outro, so I will take this opportunity to say thank you for watching. I hope the guide helped. Let me know in the comments if it helped you beat Apex or GM or whichever stage you were working on. And if you have any other requests for guides or requests for expansions to this guide or questions about this guide, don't hesitate to leave those in the comments as well.
guess. Pretty good, man. Just keep looping. Oh, he got slick. Shit, wow. <laughs> 